Hi everyone, I am Sujani, Faculty in Physics at Institute of Aeronautical Engineering, Hyderabad. Today we are going to discuss about diffraction due to double slit. If we look at the brief outline of uh, module 4, we have already covered certain topics, Huygens principle, superposition of waves, Young's double slit experiment, we have derived the expression for the fringe width. We have also seen the experiment of Newton's rings and its applications. And in the last lecture, we have seen in detail about Fraunhofer diffraction from a single slit. And today we are going to discuss about Fraunhofer diffraction due to double slit. So to understand today's lecture, it is very important to understand the basics or how what is diffraction and how diffraction takes place due to single slit. If you have missed the lecture, you I better suggest you see the previous video of diffraction due to single slit and then you can follow this video of double slit. Now let us see how we are going to discuss this topic. First, we will try to understand what is diffraction. We will have a quick recap and also we will see and get the expressions for diffraction due to single slit. As I told you, whatever expressions we get from diffraction due to single slit, we are going to use them in double slit and we are going to also see the diffraction phenomena, how it occurs due to double slit. And then we'll derive an expression for the intensity and see the conditions for central maxima, secondary maxima, and also minima. Now let us see what is diffraction. A wave passing through a small opening will diffract as shown in the figure. Means if you have a light a wave front that is incident on a plane and the plane has a small slit. This is the plane which is the small slit. I may name it as A, B. So this is the plane in which there is a small slit A, B. So when light is incident on this wave front, after passing through the opening, means when it comes out from this opening, when light falls on this plane and because it can come out through the opening, when it comes out, it travels in directions other than the original wave. So what is the direction of the original wave? This is the direction of the original wave. So the light should have gone like this. But what we observe here is light going in different directions other than the direction of the incident light. This is the first thing we need to understand about diffraction. Now what we observe is light bends around the corners of the obstacles and enters into the geometrical shadow. This phenomenon we are calling it as diffraction phenomena. If you are asked to define what is diffraction, so the bending of the light around the corners of the obstacle, okay, and then it enters the geometrical shadow. That is the definition of diffraction. And here, the size of the obstacle should be comparable with the wavelength of light. Means if the size of the obstacle is big, you may not be able to see the diffraction pattern. So always the size of the obstacle should be very small that is comparable with the wavelength of light. We know the wavelength of lights we know. So or if you take a monochromatic light of say 5890 angstrom unit, means it is 5890 into 10 power minus 10 meters. Means the size of the obstacle should be comparable with this wavelength of light we are using. Now, what happens after passing through the slit or after bending around the corners of the obstacle? The bright and dark fringes in the shadow form 
our diffraction pattern. So what we are going to get is our diffraction pattern. How we are getting the diffraction pattern due to mutual interference of secondary wavelets originating from the wavefront. So first we need to understand about diffraction and then we are going to discuss different cases. Now you see in the figure here, it is very clear. We have taken an uh, slit or an obstacle. So light is incident like this. It's a plane wavefront we are considering. So, when light passes through the slit, what is happening here is at the corners, the light will bend. So, and each point on the slit will act as a secondary source and send secondary wavelets. Then there will be mutual interference of secondary wavelets. So, these wavelets that are originating from different points, will now interfere with each other and we get a diffraction pattern. So this is the diffraction pattern you can see on the screen. This is the screen. So what we are seeing here is this is a bright band. There is a dark band. Then again a bright, dark, bright and so on. So the bright and dark fringes in the shadow form a diffraction pattern. So the diffraction pattern consists of bright and dark fringes and these are due to diffraction and also after the light diffracts there is mutual interference of the secondary wavelets and because of that we are getting the diffraction pattern. Now if you see here how the light bends. Now if light is incident like this and we imagine this is the obstacle AB so when there is an obstacle AB, what we understand here is there will be a shadow here. There should be no light that will be incident here if light travels in straight lines. So there should be no light here. But what we are understanding now is when light falls on this obstacle, around the corners of the obstacle it bends. Light bends around the corners of the obstacle and because of this in this geometrical shadow this is the geometrical shadow you will be seeing a diffraction pattern on the screen so this is what we need to know about diffraction now let us see what is diffraction due to single slit if light is passing through only one slit then what happens first we will understand and then it is easy for us to develop on it and see what happens if it is a double slit now let a parallel beam of monochromatic light of wavelength lambda be incident normally upon a narrow slit of width AB. So what we are considering, we are considering a monochromatic light. So this is the source, S represents the source and we are taking a monochromatic source. So what do we understand by monochromatic? Mono means single, chromatic means single color. So light of single wavelength. So from the source, light of single wavelength is incident normally. So we are using a lens to allow the light to fall normally. Means at right angles or perpendicular to the slit AB. AB here is the slit. So incident normally upon a narrow slit. And the width of the slit should be very small. We have seen it should be comparable with the wavelength of light. And the width of the slit is given by small e. Small e represents the width of the slit. Now, let the diffracted light be focused by a convex lens L. Now, what we have seen in diffraction at this point, around the corners, the light will bend. Some of the rays may go straight, but some of them may bend around the corners of the obstacle. This is how the ray is bending. It is making an angle theta with the ray that is going straight. So here also this ray is bending and making an angle theta. Now these rays that are diffracting are focused with the help of a convex lens L. We know convex lens is a 
converging lens. So in the path of the diffracted beam, when we place a convex lens L, we can bring them to a focus point on the screen. So this is the screen. So we may call this as the focus point P and this point where the rays come straight, we will call it as O. So it is coming on to the screen XY placed in the focal plane of the lens. So the screen is named as XY. So we are placing this convex uh, lens in the focal plane of the uh, screen so that we get the image on the screen. Now the diffraction pattern that is obtained on the screen consists of a central bright band having alternate dark and weak bright bands of decreasing intensity on both the sides. So when we talk about the central bright band, all these rays that are coming straight will come here to the focus point O and here we'll be having a bright band. This gives rise to a bright band. We have already discussed the conditions for bright band. Why we get bright band? We have uh, derived expressions also. So at the center, what we have a central band is a bright band. And on either side of it, you will have a dark band. So this is a dark band. And then again, you have a bright band, a bright band and so on with decreasing intensity. The intensity of these bright and dark bands keeps on decreasing as we go away from the central band. Now, how do we understand it in terms of wave theory? A plane wavefront is incident on the slit AB. So, this is the plane wavefront that is incident. So, we may take the wavefront like this on the slit AB. AB is the slit. So, according to Huygens' principle, each point on AB sends out secondary wavelets. So, on this, there are different points all these points will act as secondary sources and sends out secondary wavelets. And the rays proceeding in the same direction as the incident rays are focused at O. So if I talk about this ray, which is going in the same direction as the incident ray, and also this ray going in the same direction as the incident ray. So all rays that travel in the same direction as the incident ray, they all are brought to a focus point O. And if you see in the figure, these wavelets have traveled the same optical distance. The distance traveled by the ray from here and the distance traveled by the ray starting from the point B and reaching O. If you see the path traveled by them, this is the path. And this is the path. They are traveling equal paths. So, or the same path they are traveling. So, there is no path difference. There is no difference in the path that is traveled between them. So, they give rise to constructive interference. So, when, when we have discussed about different types of interference, we have clearly understood the conditions. When do we have constructive interference and when do we have destructive? The first condition is there should be no path difference or the path difference should be an integral multiple of lambda. Then in all such cases, we get constructive interference. So because here we are seeing that the rays are traveling the same distance, so the path traveled by them is the same. So there is no path difference. So they will be in phase. And because they are in phase, it gives rise to constructive interference. Constructive interference gives rise to a bright spot with the maximum intensity. So the central band here is a bright band with maximum intensity. Now let us try to get the expression for the intensity as well as the resultant amplitude. So for that, what we are going to do is we are going to draw AC perpendicular to BR. The same diagram we are uh, discussing here. So W prime, W, this is the plane wavefront. W prime W is the plane wavefront. AB, AB is the slit whose width is E. This is the width of the slit. 
Now what we are saying is the rays that are traveling straight in the same direction as the incident ray are brought to a focal point PO or simply O we call it. And those that are diffracting or bending at an angle theta okay, are brought to a point P1 or P simply. So here also this ray is also bending at an angle theta and they are brought to a focus point P1. Now the optical paths from the plane AC to P1 are equal. Now to measure the path difference between these rays, these rays that are bending, if you see in the figure, definitely there is a difference in the path traveled by the ray from A to P1 and from B to P1. So how do we calculate the path difference? So for that, what we do is we drop a perpendicular from A on to BR. So that will be AC. So AC is the perpendicular dropped onto BR. Means this is the right angle. Now, from A and C, the optical path travelled by the rays is the same from A to P and from C to P, it is the same. Only difference now is BC. BC is the extra path that is travelled by the ray that is starting from B. So, how do we calculate the path difference? So, the path difference between the wavelets from A to B in the direction theta is given by BC. So, BC simply gives us the path difference. So, how do we get BC? If you see from the geometry of the figure, this is theta. So, we are going to write sine theta. Sine theta is equal to opposite side upon hypotenuse. So, what is the side opposite to angle theta? It is BC. So, we write it as BC. And what is the hypotenuse? It is AB. So, sine theta is equal to BC upon AB. So, BC is equal to AB sine theta. And what is AB equal to? E. So, this is equal to E sine theta. So, what we are writing here, BC is equal to E sine theta. So, means we have calculated the path difference between the two rays coming from A and B and reaching the point P1. Now, what is the corresponding phase difference? We have seen that for a path difference of lambda, there will be a phase difference of 2 pi. So, whenever there is a path difference of one wavelength, then there is a phase difference of 2 pi. Now, what is the path difference we have got? It is E sine theta. So, what will be the phase difference? So, the phase difference will be 2 pi by lambda into E sine theta. So, now we have got the phase difference between the two waves. Why we are calculating the path difference and phase difference is only depending upon these conditions, we will know whether it is constructive interference or destructive interference. If it is constructive interference, we get a bright band and if it is destructive, we get a dark band. So, now we are going to calculate the phase difference that is 2 pi by lambda into E sine theta. Now, the width of the slate is now divided into n equal parts. Now, what we are going to do is this slit we are going to divide into n equal parts. Why we are going to divide it into n equal parts is each point on the slit will now act as a secondary source and send out secondary wavelets. So, how many points we are going to divide it depends upon the number of parts we are going to divide it. So, we are going to divide it into n parts. And the amplitude of vibration of each part is the same, which will be given by small a. The amplitude of vibration of the wave that is uh, coming out from each point is given by a, small a. Now, the path difference we have calculated is e sine theta. And the phase difference we have got is 2 pi by lambda into e sine theta. And now what we have done, we have divided it into n number of 
equal parts. We have divided the slit into n equal parts. Each of amplitude A. Amplitude of the wave of each part is A. Now, if I have to find, if I am dividing it into n parts like this, n number of parts. A, B is now divided into n parts. Now, if I have to find the phase difference between one and the next one, the consecutive ones. So, what we are going to do is 1 by n into total phase. Total phase we have already calculated. 2 pi by lambda into E sin theta. So, now what we are going to divide, we are going to find between two consecutive points where we have divided into n number. So, we get 1 by n into 2 pi by lambda into E sin theta. This is the total phase. Since we have divided into n parts, we are writing it as 1 by n, 2 pi by lambda into E sin theta. So, now we are going to consider this 1 by n into 2 pi by lambda into E sin theta as d for convenience. Let d be equal to 1 by n, 2 pi by lambda into E sin theta. Now, what we need to understand here is uh, a number of waves that are coming from each point on the slit and arriving at a point P. Now, what will be the resultant at that point P? So, here we will try to apply the basic law that is the polygon law of vectors. This is the polygon law of vector. Means, if there are a number of waves coming at a point, the resultant is given by the polygon law. So, what we are doing, we have a number this is one vector, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So, here for example, poly means many, we have taken 6. So, these are the number of vectors coming at a point P. Now, what will be the resultant? The resultant is given by the closing side of the polygon taken in the reverse order. So, R gives us the resultant, resultant amplitude of all these vectors. So, if n number of vibrations of the same period, same amplitude and same phase difference act on the same particle. So, this is the situation we are seeing because a number of waves coming to a point P. So, the resultant of the vibrations can be obtained by the polygon law. By constructing a polygon and then getting the amplitude, the closing side gives the resultant amplitude R. And the angle gives the phase of the resultant vibration. So, if you have to find the phase, you can calculate the angle and we get the resultant from the closing side. So, what is the formula for R? So, the general formula we have for the resultant amplitude is R is equal to A into sine ND by 2 upon sine D by 2. So, what is our D? What did we consider for D? D is equal to 1 by n into 2 pi by lambda into E sine theta. This we have considered as D. Now, the formula is A into sine ND by 2 upon sine D by 2. So, let us substitute this value of D in the resultant amplitude. So, what do we have here? R is equal to A sine n. What is the value of D? 1 by n into 2 pi by lambda into E sine theta by 2 and D by 2. So, we are going to write 2 upon sine D by 2 means 1 by n 2 pi by lambda into E sine theta by 2. So, what do we get here? n, n will get cancelled. 2, 2 also will get cancelled. So, we are left with R is equal to A sine. In the numerator, we have pi E sine theta upon lambda. In the denominator, 2 gets cancelled. So, we have sine 1 by n into pi E sine theta by lambda. This is what we have. 
So we are going to write sine pi e sine theta by lambda in the numerator. And in the denominator, we have sine pi e sine theta by n lambda. This is how we have calculated. Now let us make a substitution. Let a alpha be equal to pi e sine theta by lambda. The whole thing, we are considering it as alpha. It's a substitution for pi e sine theta by lambda. So we have a is equal to sine alpha upon sine alpha by n because we have n in the denominator. So we get sine alpha upon sine alpha by n. Now, if you see alpha by n is very small because alpha itself is small and we are dividing it into n number. So this value becomes a small. So whenever uh, the value is small, whenever theta is small, for all small angles of theta, sine theta tends to theta. If theta is very, very small. Now definitely our alpha by n is very small. So sine alpha by n becomes simply alpha by n. We can substitute for sine alpha by n, alpha by n because sine theta becomes theta. So in place of theta, we have alpha by n. So a sine alpha upon alpha by n since it is very small. Now we can take n to the uh, numerator. We get n a sine alpha by alpha. A is the amplitude of one wave and n a is the amplitude of n number of waves. So n into a will give us the amplitude a. We can both are constant. So we can write a for a given n into sine alpha by alpha. So what we are getting the resultant R, the resultant amplitude is given by A sine alpha by alpha. So once you get the resultant amplitude, you can very easily calculate the intensity. Intensity is proportional to the square of the amplitude. I is proportional to R square. So here we keep the constant aside. So we are writing it as I is equal to R square. What is the R we got? A sine alpha by alpha. So square of it will be a square sine alpha by alpha square. So what we have seen now is we understood if there is a diffraction due to a single slit and when the slit is divided into n e number of equal parts and then the superposition of the secondary wavelets emanating from these slits or these secondary sources that gives rise to a wave whose amplitude is given by R is A sine alpha by alpha and the intensity is A square sine alpha by alpha square. I want you to remember this expression because when we derive for double slit, we are going to use this expression for R as well as I directly. Now let us discuss about double slit. We have already understood what happens in a single slit. Now let us extend it to double slit. So here also what we see, let a parallel beam of monochromatic light of wavelength lambda be incident normally upon two parallel slits A, B and C, D. So we have two slits here. This is one slit A, B and this is another slit C, D. So A, B and CD. They are two slits. So parallel beam of light is incident. This is the source, monochromatic source. So light that is coming from this source, monochromatic source, is made parallel with the help of this lens. This is made parallel. So light coming parallel is incident on two slits now, AB and CD. What is the width each of width E? and separated by an opaque space D. So the width of the slit is E. So if I take this as E and the separation between the two slits is D. So we are writing the total as E plus D. This is E plus D. So the distance between the corresponding points on the two slits means if I take exactly this point, and this point or this point and this point, the corresponding points, the distance between them is E plus D. Now the diffracted light, because whenever we have a slit, 
light falling on it because of diffraction it bends around the corner of the obstacle so now the diffracted light is focused on to the screen xy with the help of a lens n okay so i say this is the diffracted beam which is bending at an angle theta diffraction due to the slit here and here also there is diffraction due to the slit so the diffracted light is focused with the help of a convex lens on the screen xy placed in the focal plane so everything is similar here till now what we have seen in single slit the only difference is there are two slits so we are considering both the slits and the distance between them is taken as e plus d now the pattern obtained on the screen is a diffraction pattern due to the single slit on which a system of interference fringes is superposed so if you are taking two slits separately so what we see here according to huygens principle every point in the slit ab and cd sends out secondary wavelets in all directions okay so now the waves that are coming from ab and from cd will now superimpose and then you get a diffraction pattern on the screen so from the theory of diffraction at single slit what we have seen the resultant amplitude due to the wavelets diffracted from each slit is given by r is equal to a sin alpha by alpha this is what we have derived the expression now so if you are considering the slit ab so due to ab we have r is equal to a sin alpha by alpha and due to cd also the resultant is a sin alpha by alpha and what is alpha we have taken pi e sin theta by lambda now what we are going to consider is we will consider two slits as equivalent to two coherent sources placed at the middle points of s1 and s2 and they are sending out waves each sending a wavelet of amplitude a sin alpha by alpha so when we have seen the resultant to be equal to r is equal to a sin alpha by alpha what we are considering here from ab whatever is coming out the resultant is a sin alpha by alpha this is ab and from cd whatever is coming again the resultant is a sin alpha by alpha so what we are going to see here is each is sending a wavelet of amplitude a sin alpha by alpha in the direction theta so the resultant will be now at the point p will be the interference between the two waves of amplitude a sin alpha by alpha i hope you understand so we have considered a number of uh, secondary sources and whatever is coming from here the resultant is a sin alpha by alpha and cd also we have divided into a number of slits and whatever the resultant we have got is a sin alpha by alpha now if you keep a screen and all the rays that are coming from ab all the rays that are coming from cd if they are superimposing at a point p so this will be like a wave of resultant a sin alpha by alpha interfering with a wave of resultant a sin alpha by alpha and they have a phase difference of delta let delta be the phase difference between these two resultants so how we are going to derive the expression so for that what we do is we draw s1k perpendicular to s2k so this is s1 the first source because we have considered no let this be a source s1 and this be a source s2 at the center of the slits whose resultant we have got okay so now the path difference between the wavelets from s1 and s2 in the direction theta we have to calculate what is the path difference so for that we have dropped perpendicular from s1 on to s2 so s1k is the perpendicular on to s2k now from this plane s1k whatever the path traveled by the rays that is the same this path is the same so the difference here is only this s2k is the difference now how do we get s2k if this is theta so sin theta is equal to opposite side s2k upon 
hypotenuse S1, S2. So, S2K will be equal to S1, S2 into sin theta. So, what is S1, S2 we have taken as E plus D because E is the width of the slit and D is the separation between the two. So, we can write it as E plus D into sin theta. So, our S2K is equal to E plus D into sin theta. Now, if you are having a path difference of E plus D into sin theta, what will be the phase difference? So, again, we'll go back to if there is a path difference of lambda, the phase difference is 2 pi. So, here the path difference is E plus D into sin theta. So, what will be the phase difference? So, 2 pi by lambda into E plus D sin theta is the phase difference. So, we have written the phase difference delta given by 2 pi by lambda into E plus D sin theta. Now, how do we get the resultant amplitude? R at P can be determined by the vector amplitude diagram. What is the vector amplitude diagram we are going to take? So, we are talking about two vectors. One is OA, maybe coming from A, which is given, the resultant is given by A sin alpha by alpha. And the other one is coming from B, which is again given by A sin alpha by alpha. So, if we want to get the resultant of this two, so we will draw the diagram like this. We can use the triangle law of forces. So, this is OA and OP. So, this gives us the resultant in the reverse order. So, how we are going to write OB is OB square is equal to OA square plus AB square plus 2OA into AB into cos BAC means we are going to take this angle. This will be the angle between the two vectors. So, this is the angle. So, cos BAC is the angle. So, now we are going to substitute. We have seen R square is equal to OA square plus AB square plus 2OA into OB into, we'll write cos delta. Okay. So, what is our OA? A sin alpha by alpha vector. What is our AB? A sin alpha by alpha plus 2 OA. This is again OA and this is OB. OA into AB, sorry. Into cos delta, the angle between them. Now, we are going to simplify this expression. So, A sin alpha by alpha square plus A sin alpha by alpha square. What we are going to get is 2 times A sin alpha by alpha square plus 2. Here again A sin alpha by alpha, A sin alpha by alpha. So, when we multiply again here we get A sin alpha by alpha whole square into cos delta. So, this term and this term is common in both. So, these two terms have 2 into A sin alpha by alpha whole square as common. So, we can write it as, take it out as common and write A sin alpha by alpha whole square. If we take out, what is left here is 1 plus cos delta. 2 also have taken out 2 into A sin alpha by alpha square and 1 plus cos delta. So, we can write the formula using uh, 1 plus cos 2 theta will be equal to 2 cos square theta. So, here we have 1 plus cos delta. So, it will be cos square delta by 2. So, 2 into A sin alpha by alpha whole square into 2 cos square delta by 2. So, 2 into 2 gives us 4 a square sin square alpha by alpha square into cos square delta by 2. This is how we are going to simplify the expression. So, what is the final expression we have here is a square sin square alpha by alpha square into 4 cos square delta by 2. The same expression we are getting here. Now, let us do one more substitution. What we are going to do now is for beta, we are going to substitute 
delta by 2. Delta by let delta by 2 be equal to beta. So, in place of delta by 2, we are putting beta. So, what is delta by 2? We have already seen delta. Delta is the phase difference which is given by pi by lambda into pi by 2 pi by lambda into e plus d sin theta. So, by 2 will give us pi by lambda into e plus d sin theta. Now, if we have to write i, i will be equal to r square. So, all this is r square. So, what will be our r square? 4 a square sin square alpha by alpha square into cos square beta. So, this will be the resultant square and resultant square gives us the intensity. So, the intensity i is equal to r square. So, we have got r square. So, what is r square? 4 a square sin square alpha by alpha square into cos square beta. So, now let us see how this pattern is going to be. Now, the intensity of the resultant pattern depends upon two factors. The first one is alpha sin square alpha by alpha square, which gives us the diffraction pattern due to each slit, individual slit. And cos square beta, which gives the interference pattern due to the diffracted light waves from the two slits. So, are you able to understand what we have in the resultant is two terms. One term, other things are constant. 4 is constant, A is a constant. But the terms we need to focus now is sin square alpha by alpha square, which gives us the diffraction pattern due to each slit individually. And then we have cos square beta, which gives the interference pattern due to the diffracted light waves from the two slits. Now, the diffracted term sin square alpha by alpha square gives a central maximum in the direction theta is equal to 0. Theta is equal to 0 means all the rays that travel normally and will not have any bending at the corners. So, what it gives is a central maxima. So, if you see here at alpha is equal to 0, we are having a maxima. This is the maxima which we call as the central maxima. This is denoted by the term sin square alpha by alpha square and then it will have alternately minima and subsidiary maxima. So, this is a minima at pi, 2 pi, 3 pi. All these are minima, minimum intensity on either side and in between the minima you will have a secondary maxima and these will be of decreasing intensity. If you see the intensity of the central one and the secondary, they, it is going to decrease continuously. So, the minima are obtained in the directions given by sin alpha is equal to 0, where alpha takes on the values of plus or minus m pi, means m take the values 1, 2, 3 and so on except 0, because for 0, m is equal to 0, we are getting the central maxima. Now, the interference pattern cos square beta gives a set. We have seen what uh, sin square alpha by alpha square gives. Now, we are going to see the interference due to cos square beta. So, it gives a set of equidistant dark and bright fringes as an Young's double slit experiment. In Young's double slit experiment, we have seen purely an interference phenomena where we had alternate bright and dark fringes of equal intensity and they are equidistant. So, here due to cos square beta, we are having a, a interference pattern which consists of dark and bright fringes. Now, the bright fringes that is the maxima are obtained in the directions given by cos square beta is equal to 1. So, if cos square beta is equal to 1, then it will be a bright fringe. And when will cos square beta be equal to 1 for all values of beta equal to plus r minus n pi? So, if beta is equal to plus r minus n pi, you will get 1. So, that gives to rise to a maxima. So, what is the value of beta we have taken? Pi by lambda into e plus d sin theta. That should be equal to n lambda. Or if you are taking this onto the other side, I can write it as e plus d into sin theta is equal to n pi upon pi by lambda. So, pi and pi will get cancelled. Lambda goes to the numerator. So, e plus d into sin theta is equal to n lambda. And where n takes on the value 0, 1, 2 and so on. 
So the various maxima corresponding to n is equal to 0, 1, 2 are 0 order, first order, second order maxima. So for n is equal to 0, we got the central maxima. So we are calling it a central maxima or 0 order. And on either side, we have the first order, second order. If n is equal to 1, first order. n is equal to 2, second order and so on. Now, the intensity distribution is the resultant of the diffraction pattern. And what we see here is a plot of the product of the constant term 4a square, the diffraction term sine square alpha by alpha square and the interference term cos square beta. So, I, we have kept 4a square the constant term aside and we have seen what is the interference uh, diffraction pattern due to sine square alpha by alpha square and the interference pattern due to cos square beta. Now, we are going to see the entire pattern. So, the entire pattern may be considered as consisting of interference fringes due to the light from both the slits and the intensities of these fringes is governed by the diffraction occurring at individual slits. So, this is the gist of what we have seen till now. So, what uh, if you are having two slits, what we are having, we are having an interference uh, term due to diffraction term and also an interference term and we have a constant and the resultant pattern is going to be like this. So, this is due to sine square alpha by alpha square diffraction pattern and this is due to cos square beta, the interference pattern. So, at the point on a screen, the resultant is due to both. So, due to 4a square sine square alpha by alpha square into cos square beta, what is the pattern we are going to get is something like this. There is a central maxima. Inside you will have the interference pattern and then you will have minima. These are the secondary maxima, secondary maxima. These are the minima. Again, on the other side also, we have minima. But in between, what you have is the interference pattern. So, if you see in a light, how you see the pattern is something like this. So, the double slit intensity distribution due to small e is equal to 0 0.0088 centimeter and lambda is 6.328 into 10 power minus 5 and d is equal to 0 0.035 and 0 0.07 respectively. So, with the variation in the d, that is small d, small d here is what? The distance between the two slits. So, when small d varies, the pattern also varies. This is how we are going to get the pattern. Now, let us see how if you are seeing it on a film, the diffraction pattern is going to be like this. This is the central maxima we are seeing due to the diffraction. And in between this, what you have is the interference pattern. In the interference pattern, what you have? You have a bright fringe, a dark fringe, bright fringe and so on. So, here also bright and on either side you have dark. They are all equal size. So, here also for different orders we are seeing. This is the first central one and the first order. So, here we are seeing for different orders also as you go away. But the diffra in the diffraction pattern, what we see here is the intensity goes on decreasing. Photographs and intensity curves for double slit diffraction pattern. So, this gives you the clear picture of what happens when we are using two slits, double slit instead of a single slit. So, thank you and uh, see you again in the next lecture. Like, share and subscribe. Hit the bell icon for more updates.